here's the main uh, motivation for this work. Uh, algorithmic mechanism design and algorithmic contract design uh, generally consider, like in the previous talk, how the designer deals with some complex situation uh, that has some communication, computational complexity or communication complexity or other types. Uh, but agents uh, are perfectly able to optimize uh, sometimes they have simple problems, sometimes not so simple, but we assume they always choose the best solution. Uh, in reality, uh, what uh, uh, agents actually do in many uh, real-life situations, uh, may, their main job is to deal with complex situations. They do information processing. And so basically, uh, the idea is to think about the agent's effort. So like usually in contract design, we think effort is just a choice, work, don't work, and that affects output in some black box reduced form way. So we actually want to model this effort as information processing, solving some kind of complex problems. Uh, so how do we model that? And we take a somewhat uh, maybe extreme view of this is that the agent is optimally dealing with a complex problem. So there's some ex-ante stage where the agent is optimizing subject to some constraints on information processing that he has exposed. And um, now the popular way of uh, doing this is called rational inattention, which is really a way of modeling optimal flexible information acquisition. Uh, so here's the motivation for this. Suppose that you have a costly communication channel into your brain and you're facing a trade-off. Uh, if you get more information into your brain, you will make better decisions, but it will be more costly because you have to pay for every bit of information that's getting into your brain. And so you can use information theory to derive a con convenient uh, kind of reduced form expression for this, what's the expected number of bits that need to be transmitted into your brain in an optimal encoding, assuming that you can amortize over many independent instances, it's just mutual information between the input, which is the state of the world, and the output, which is the decision you need to make. And the solution to this problem determines what you pay attention to, so optimal, what kind of information you get into your brain, and what kind of decision do you make. So that's a somewhat realistic way of thinking. We think about attention because, of course, we have some hardwired mechanisms for what you pay attention to, but you actually adapt optimally to what actually matters or not. For example, uh, you sometimes people say you only pay attention to the first digits of the price, not the last digits because it's much less important. Uh, now, another example, I guess hardwired, you would pay more attention to bright colors, but then when you go online and you see that all the bright, flashy ads are useless, you adjust and you stop paying attention to them. So you opt optimize your attention based on your decision problem. So the question is how do you incentivize this kind of rationally and attentive agents? Uh, the first step is you need to, as a building block, to understand like decision problem with rational attention. That's well understood, but I still need to explain it because it's an important building block. Then the next uh, thing I want to talk or mention my, is a paper that we already have written with Alex on basically information design for rationally and attentive agent, how you can try to persuade this kind of agent. And then I'll talk about some more recent uh, work um, about incentivizing with payments uh, with one agent, and then when you have many agents, how can you spread uh, the work among many agents and can you have wisdom of the crowd kind of situation where each agent does only a little bit of work but overall you can set up some kind of aggregation market where you actually get a lot of information about what you want to, to find out. <coughs> okay, so here's the decision problem. So this is the state of the world <coughs> denoted by theta and you need to make an action denoted by A. So till this will denote random variables and then there's some payoff depending on the uh, action and the state. And this is your channel, <coughs> but the channel has uh, a per bit cost of lambda of information transmission, and you can design some kind of optimal encoding. We're not going to do encoding itself, we just assume, you know, we assume information theory solution. And so uh, the cost will just be proportional to the mutual information. Uh, so you're basically designing action as a random variable and the cost is per lambda times the mutual information between the action 
and the state of the world. So your objective function is expected payoff from the decision uh, minus lambda times mutual information between the decision and the state of the world. And the mutual information, well, there's a formula how it's defined. There are many ways to, uh, equivalent ways to define it, but uh, this is just one, okay? <coughs> Another way to define it is the expected entropy reduction between uh, your prior beliefs and posterior beliefs about the state conditional on, on the decision. Okay, so what's the solution to this problem? So as I said, it is well known by this point. I think it was derived actually several times because actually rate distortion theory is another way, another uh, place where this problem comes up. So the solution can be expressed in terms of the odds or the ratio of probabilities of choosing two different actions conditional on the state. And uh, that basically, uh, uh, on the left hand side you have conditional on the state, on the right hand side you have unconditional, so just kind of marginal odds. And so it has, it's multiplied by exponent of the difference in the payoffs. So the idea is actually very simple. So you deviate from the prior, you are sensitive to the state, so you deviate from the prior odds to, uh, based on how high the stakes are. So if the stakes are very high, you exponentiate them, and you say you basically make the right choice with probability close to one. If the state stakes are low, so actually the payoff is the same in, in, uh, from the two actions in some state, then you just stick to the prior odds. You kind of don't pay any attention in that situation. <laughs> so in a, in a special case where the actions are exactly symmetric, so the, uh, by symmetry, the solution will have, uh, un the prior will be uh, uniform. So you'll just randomize uniformly over actions from the ex-ante viewpoint. And then you can just delete the, the first uh, factor and you just get a quantal response solution. So I think that's kind of more familiar, but that here the difference from the quantal response is exactly that the prior does, is not going to be uniform, so that depending on the extent of which actions are good, which actions are bad, you will be biased towards actions that are better. In particular, for actions that are just, uh, sim, are just uh, very bad exante, you will just not play, you play them as probability zero, so you're not going to choose them ever, because you're not basically going to pay any attention to them if exante, they seem to be pretty bad. Okay, but how do you actually find, uh, how do you close um, uh, the problem and solve for everything? Well, you need to satisfy the fixed point condition, obviously, that the expectation of the posterior equals the prior. So that's a fixed point condition makes it sometimes a little bit tricky to solve, but that, that's how you solve everything. Uh, okay, so here's an illustration, special case, where you have two actions and the payoff, uh, so like zero and one, so you can think Zero is not acting, one is acting, and the payoff from acting is theta. So theta is payoff for acting versus not acting. So, so you plot the probability of acting and the solution is a function of the state. So you say the state is zero, so you're indifferent, you just stick to the prior probability. Now, if the state is very high, so you go, of course, you approach uh, a probability of one because it's really, a much better action is to choose one. If uh, the state is very negative, you approach zero. So this is a logit curve. You get the logit uh, function here. Now, how, the only thing is how do you nail the intercept, right? So it's where do you draw the logit curve? And so as an example, if you have only two possible states, then you can illustrate this fixed point condition as follows. So here you look at the probability of acting in the two states and you average them using the straight line. So when you average them, you get this point and the average has to be the same as the ex-ante probability. And so that's uh, determine, determining where you draw this curve. Okay, another way to think about this uh, situation is we define what's called attention effort, we call it, which is just the KL divergence from the prior probability of acting to the posterior, and uh, it takes this shape. Intuitively, this is like how much effort you put in state theta, and in state zero, you don't put any effort because it doesn't matter which action you choose, and you, you, you just play the prior, you don't diverge, but the bigger the stakes are, the more effort, the more attention you pay, the more you diverge from the prior. Okay, and of course, if you take expectation of that, you'll take the, get the total uh, mutual information, the total attention of it. Okay, so that's the solution to the single agent problem. Now, how do we 
persuade this agent, imagine you have a principal who is standing between you and the state of the world. So you cannot observe the state of the world directly, but the principal can show you a signal about the state of the world, and this is what you pay attention to. Otherwise, it's the same problem, and we specialize to the 0-1 case that I just showed, so there's only binary action to choose. Um, so the agent's payoff is the same, except now you pay attention to the state of the world. You are not, sorry, not to the state of the world, to, only to the signal. And the principal's payoff is, could be a mixture between trying to persuade you to choose this action and trying to persuade you to choose the right action. So he puts some weight on your own utility and some weight on just choosing the action. So this is the beta. So beta equals one, we call state independent preference, where he always wants you to act. And beta equals zero, we call aligned preference. Basically, he just wants to help you, but there is still a conflict because he, you, know, you are lazy and he doesn't care about your attention cost, and you do. So there's still an incentive conflict. <laughs> okay, and we assume commitment by the principal. So the principal commits to information structure, and the agent observes the information structure and chooses how to respond to it. And this is different from chip talk. So chip talk can also be solved, but not surprisingly, you'll have less communication with chip talk when there's less commitment. Okay, now one, uh, there are several implications of this particular form of attention cost, which seem intuitive, but uh, still important to highlight. One is the language in which the signal is expressed doesn't matter, only information matters, only posterior beliefs. By the way, it's, it's not true for other types of costs, but it's true for this cost. <coughs> so this actually simplifies the problem in this case. Both the principal and the agent only care about the posterior mean. So the signal could just be the posterior mean of the state. Another thing is uh, the agent uh, would not pay attention to any signal. It seems like to some people, well, if you just tell agent act or don't act, this is only one bit of information. Why, why wouldn't the agent just obey if it's a good uh, recommendation? But the agent would never obey for sure because the marginal cost at full attention is infinite. So the agent would always prefer to save some cost by introducing noise. Optimal response is always noisy, and it just, if you think about information theory, it's not surprising. Well, there's, there's, uh, when you do compression, you optimally do some lossy compression when you have many IID signals. <coughs> A third implication is that the agent always prefers to have more information. So the agent doesn't need the principal here to aggregate information for him because the, this is already assumed that the agent has you know, the optimal aggregation technolo technology at his disposal. So the agent always wants more information. It's not like he's not suffering. He, you know, there's no problem for him to have many like fine print things and so on. He can always deal with it. But the principal would want to hide some information to influence the agent to influence the agent's attention and to influence his action. So how do we solve the persuasion problem? Well, uh, so <laughs> if you uh, fix the prior probability of acting, let's call it alpha, then you calculate the posterior probability by this logic function that I showed you. Now the challenge is that you have this extra constraint that the expectation of the posterior has to equal to the prior and we could just put Lagrange multiplier on it. So we have a Lagrangian here and, we, and uh, we want to maximize the Lagrangian expected uh, um, expectation of this function over all distributions of posterior means that they have to be mean preserving um, contractions of the actual state. So this problem actually is pretty well understood at this point and we use the existing literature to characterize the solution. The solution will actually have three intervals. You will have, assuming that the state itself is continuously distributed, you actually don't need to randomize. It's a partitional thing. You just, uh, but really what you do is, uh, in the middle interval, you're going to fully reveal information separate, and the top and the bottom, you're going to have two pools of information. So I'll just give you an illustration. In the case of aligned preferences, so this, your objective function looks like this, and the key thing is that the objective function has a, um, concave region, convex region, concave region. Of course, this is what's driving, you know, the pooling and separation, not surprisingly, but there's some subtlety about how do you find these cutoffs to make everything work. So here in the middle, you're fully separating. 
Uh, so you're telling the agent exactly what the state of the world is and let, let him do the right, uh, whatever he wants to do. Of course, he is always uh, responding noisily. And when you have uh, high stakes, uh, you pull the high positive stakes into one atom. You just tell him, okay, do it. Or you'd here you tell him, don't do it. And here you tell him, okay, here's the information and you decide by yourself. This is like mask wearing, you know, the CDC says, Wear the mask, don't wear the mask, or you know, here's read everything and figure it out. Um, right. Now, why is this optimal? Here's another intuition we have for why this is optimal. If you actually think about your attention function, it looks like this. So it also has this kind of concave, convex, concave uh, uh, shape. And here you want to increase the agent's attention, but uh, how do you increase attention? You pull medium stakes with high stakes so that uh, you, uh, the agent will actually pay more attention because of concavity, but you separate the medium stakes from the low stakes so that the agent still pays some attention to them because uh, he knows they're, you know, they're, not, they're not close to zero. So that's another intuition. Okay, now uh, this, is, okay, this is in the case of align, align preferences. State, uh, the other extreme is state independent preference where you want to convince the agent to act. So it's somewhat similar, but uh, without going in detail through the pictures, the main thing is that here sometimes you actually don't want the agent to pay attention because you want him to make the decision even if it's bad for him. And so here you actually get uh, separation at the bottom. So when the um, uh, state is negative, he shouldn't act, but here you, by telling him exactly the state, you actually uh, reduce his attention and uh, exploit his inattention and increase the probability that he actually makes a mistake and does um, and actually acts. So, okay, so that's just high level overview. Uh, now I want to switch to the incentivizing by payment uh, situation where, uh, okay, now the agent can observe the state of the world or pay attention to it but you can offer him payments to uh, <coughs> influence his attention. And the payments could be a function of his action and the state of the world, which we assume is observed ex post. So it's a ground truth is observed in the end. Um, and the agent uh, is assumed to be risk averse. Otherwise, you can implement the first best by just selling him the firm, so to speak. So he has a concave, as usual, Bernoulli utility function, U. And the principal, his reservation to it is zero, and the principal has a kind of profit, benefit, B of A theta that he cares about. So this is a somewhat uh, kind of more conventional uh, principal agent model with a risk averse agent, but the complexity here is that the agent has this particular rich action space, which is uh, his attention strategy. <coughs> okay. So in the first best, as usual, you'll just fully insure the agent. You just compensate him for the attention cost, just paying him a lump sum. And, um, and then you just choose attention strategy in the optimal way. So there's nothing um, interesting here. What's interesting is in the second best, remember the agent uh, will be uh, choosing his attention strategy. So this is joint probability distribution between action and the state is his attention strategy. Uh, depending on V, and V is his utility function that's determined by the payment. But so here we can actually solve it for the utility function. We can ask what payment should we give him or what utility should we induce in, in order to make him choose this attention strategy. So the interesting thing is what you get is the log scoring rule. So the, um, the mutual information uh, cost of information gathering translates into the log scoring rule. This is what you need to do to incentivize him to choose uh, this attention. So this is based on the posteriors. So what's the log scoring rule? Well, he's reporting his posterior uh, and you pay him, here it's based on the difference, it's more convenient, between the prior uh, uh, and the posterior that he reported over the state. <laughs> um, so the log posterior for the realized state is what he's actually getting. Okay, so and when you do that in expectation, you compensate him for the attention cost, but you have one more instrument here. You can add any function of the state because it does not affect his incentives, and so the participation constraint just requires the expectation of this function should be non-negative. You can use it in order to reduce the agent's risk. 
So the problem reduces to, okay, what function of the state do you choose in order to reduce the agent's risk? And then what is the optimal uh, attention strategy that you want him to do? So it's a little com complicated, but there is nothing that you cannot use with the Lagrangian. So with the Lagrangian, so I'll just give you the solution. The solution is the payment is going to be some, there's some separability in the solution, which is nice. So the payment is some function of output plus a function of action plus a function of state. So there's some structure. And this function g itself is actually, we know what it is. It just comes from the agent's utility function where what is h? Well, I forgot to set somewhere. h is the inverse of u. OK, so h is the inverse of the Bernoulli utility function. And then you calculate g this way. And you can, so OK, so at this point, I don't have a great intuition for why and what this actually means, except in the case of log utility, you actually get an even much simpler solution. You just get a linear contract where you give a share of output plus uh, s uh, some function of uh, uh, action and some function of the state. OK, so now, um, by the way, paying just on output, as you sometimes you restrict to pay just on output, that wouldn't be optimal in this situation. You also want to pay based on the action and the state. OK, now we want to say, what happens if you can hire many agents instead of one? Why would we want to do that? And how does it help? So here, so one agent gets information, sends a signal to the other agent. The other agent gets more information, sends another signal, could have many agents. In the end, you choose an action. OK, so why would you want to do? And then you can also compensate the agents based on some uh, payments. OK, so first of all, why would you want to hire many agents? So let's assume that there are no costs of communication between agents. The only costs are just getting information from, just, uh, from the world. So uh, it's actually <laughs> optimal to have agents work sequentially instead of simultaneously. You can show that given this information cost, it would be actually exponentially wasteful when you have many agents to force them to gather information simultaneously. Essentially, when they do it sequentially, each agent can get one more bit of information, like one more digit you know, of the state of the world, roughly speaking. And that's much more efficient than just working simultaneously. <laughs> and so uh, also, you can say, without loss, the agents will just be passing on beliefs to each other. So I learned something. I report my beliefs about the world to the next agent. So if this is the belief space, like the simplex of beliefs, so let's say there's three states of the world. If this is our prior, so the first agent will get some information and report some, let's say there's three possible beliefs that he could generate, and he reports which one he actually got to the second agent. Then for every realization of the first agent, the second agent then does his job, and so on. So you get a belief martingale that way. Um, and uh, actually, the total effort, the total effort is the total mutual information between everything you learn and the state of the world will just be the sum of individual efforts. So the efforts are additive in the situation, which is nice because then you know, <laughs> given the convexity or concavity in the agent's utility or convexity in the inverse utility, uh, the optimal thing to do is just to spread the effort you know, given the total amount of effort that you want, the optimal thing is just to spread it equally among the agents. When you spread it equally among the agents, also it's optimal to hire as many agents as you can because it reduces the marginal cost. And so in the limit, you get this kind of first best cost of uh, acquiring IBITS information by having many agents. So the more agents, the better, right, in this situation. And this is the limit cost. <laughs> but this is the first best. So the question is, what happens in the second best if you can have um, uh, many agents, but you have to incentivize them? So first, what do you pay them? So you can show that it's still sequential. You still hire them sequentially. And you pay each agent a function of his report, the previous report, and the state of the world. Okay. So and now you see that looks like a market scoring rule. And actually, just by the same argument as before, what you have to do is pay the log market scoring rule. So the log market scoring rule is how you want to incentivize these agents, uh, except that you do it in utility terms. This is the utility, and the payment, of course, has to be calculated by taking the inverse of the utility. <laughs> OK, so let's just uh, restrict attention. Of course, there's also this term that 
doesn't depend on the agency port that you can play with, but for simplicity, let's not play with it. Just set it to zero, and that will satisfy interim participation constraints. That means the agent who didn't change beliefs, you can always do nothing, not change beliefs, and get zero payment. So that's how, in real life, there's always the option of not participating. That's how these rules work in real life. Okay, and so here the agent is exactly compensated for the acquisition cost. Now, one problem people notice with the scoring rules is that you have the incentive to report first, given the information that you have. But of course here, because information acquisition is costly, it's exactly offset by the fact that it's easier to get information once you already got more information. So here's the actual complete indifference. You're exactly, given that any information acquisition is costly, you're completely indifferent the costs are exactly compensated. You're indifferent of you know, what to do, when to do it. <coughs> okay. so, uh, so one idea is that probably, when, yeah, okay. So when you have more agents, it seems like you can incentivize them maybe uh, with less risk. And can you approach the first best by uh, kind of spreading uh, effort very thinly among many agents and get wisdom of the crowds? And so the main result is that generally we cannot do it. Because so one idea you have, maybe you want to have a diffusion process, which is each agent will only move beliefs a tiny bit. And you have many, many agents. And so for this limit, we calculated the expected cost of incentivizing, and you see it's not the first best. There is the first best component, and there is a risk premium that depends on the concavity of the agency utility function. And intuitively, in the diffusion process, beliefs still have to move quite a bit. You know, like in the Brownian motion, there's still quite a bit of movement in every small period of time, and you cannot just eliminate the risk, and you cannot eliminate the risk premium. So, but long story short, we still don't have an exact solution to this problem. The only thing we know, if beliefs were exactly observed themselves, if like beliefs were verifiable, then you can actually approach the first best because you don't have to, you can reduce the risk Instead of paying on the state of the world and waiting, and that's pretty risky, you just pay based on the beliefs, take expectation of the state of the world. So just pay on how your beliefs are different, and then you can approach the first best, but in this world you cannot. Okay, and so that's basically the end. I mean, we can do some generalizations. It turns out we can generalize to other kinds of costs that are called uniformly posterior separable cost, which is a, covers a mutual information as a special case. And this cost actually is interesting, are, uh, turns out to be equivalent to more general proper scoring rules. So you can basically interpret the like market scoring rules as a kind of as a dual, as a way to compensate for some kind of information acquisition cost of this cost. Okay, um, and you can maybe then see what, what's optimal. Okay, I think it's interesting to consider costly communication between agents, but of course, if it's really costly, then we go back to the situation where there's no, you only have, need one agent, it's kind of wasteful to have another agent because you can just read the state of the world yourself. And uh, of course, it would be nice to think about robustness of this model. Okay, so I'll just stop here, and I don't know if this. Okay. <laughs> So in the, in the interest of time, uh, let's take questions uh, offline to the yeah. uh, break. And uh, let's reconvene at 10.35 for Manisha's talk. Thanks uh, again to Ilya.